welcome to J Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Okay, well, this episode, we have our first returning guest, Dr. Alone Burstein. Dr. Alone, if you remember from our previous episode, is a professor in the political science department at UC Irvine, teaching about terrorism, Israel, and Zionism. In this episode, we go through a whole bunch of recent current event issues in Israel and really talk it out in terms of the good, the bad, and the ugly. As you'll notice, we are not shy in our criticism of some of Israel's recent events, and we really get into some of the weeds and nuances here of how to view the wider media landscape when it comes to both the good and the bad that Israel's involved in. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, we are back with our first returning guest, Dr. Alon Bersin. Doctor, thank you so much for being our first returning guest and coming back on to J-Life with Daniel. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Always a pleasure. I'm so excited to uh, get into all things Israel in terms of current events and sort of wider global politics. Um, before we start, how has your last couple months been? Last time we interviewed you, it was sort of two months into your tenure in Irvine. Now you've been here at UCI for at least two and a half quarters. How, how's life? It has definitely improved and been a wonderful experience. Um, as I said, I think last time Irvine is very different from the atmosphere and environment that I used to be in. Um, but overall, I have fully embraced the relaxation of Southern California, as you promised I would. This is great. No, I know. And also, you know, all of our listeners are very uh, Southern California biased. So it's a very diplomatic answer, spoken like a true uh, true political science person. Um, okay, so let's let's hop right into current events. Obviously, the war against Ukraine is not necessarily a current event. It started almost two months ago. But one of sort of the big stories, I think, coming out of the Jewish community vis-a-vis Ukraine is Israel's international position. And it seemed like Israel was and still is, to some extent, very hesitant to sort of formally condemn Russia. Is that is that how you see it before getting into any other questions? Former, formally, Israel tried to maintain its neutrality. Um, and this was done with a lot of considerations of politics, with considerations of Russia's presence in Syria. Um, and then the prime minister, Naftali Bennett, sort of took the stance of in order to try to broker peace, we, Israel needs to maintain its neutrality. This fractured pretty quickly when the foreign minister and alternative prime minister, Yair Lapid, was more forceful in condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine and specifically sort of calling out the bad guy, so to speak. And the position of neutrality sort of gradually broke down through a different series of events. But Israel still tried and to some extent is trying to maintain that position of at least ambiguity. Mm-hmm. So, so in your mind, because obviously a lot of people in the West, both leaders of countries and also just a lot of activists on the ground, even to some extent, a lot of sort of run of the mill pro-Israel Jews that are sort of living in America that obviously are horrified with what's going on in Ukraine. We're very surprised and aghast about Israel, not to necessarily play devil's advocate, but it sounds like what you're saying is for Israel, it actually matters on the ground to some extent. I mean, in America, we can sort of suck up the higher gas prices for a couple of weeks or whatever. Israel is actually bordering Russian governmental presence. So not necessarily that Israel made the correct moral decision, but Israel actually has a much more difficult pragmatic calculus to make here. Yes, that, or I'll say at least that is Israel's stance and its claim for why it should maintain this neutrality. To, to say specifically that Israel has more considerations than other countries, Russia is a big country. It borders many, many countries in the world. It has interests and military presence in many countries. And those countries took a much firmer stance against the Russian invasion. So even though Israel has bothered to repeatedly try to state that its security considerations are unique and that it needs to maintain these good relations with Russia because of Russia's presence in Syria or the Jewish population that's in Russia and in Ukraine or things like that, other countries have shown that even though they have much graver security considerations like Russian troops on their borders, they have taken firmer stances. So... It's difficult to say that Israel is really unique in this, but it certainly tried to present that uh, that sort of line, at least. Got it. So let's let's unpack this a little bit because, in in some way, this is almost one such natural conclusion of like the hardcore political Zionist philosophy of 
the only thing that matters is Israel's, you know, self-government and self-autonomy and security and basically like F you to all international morals and norms because, you know, how much did that help Jews throughout history? Is, is that sort of the read on this? I mean, it is sort of astonishing from, from some perspective that one of the most unethical things that's happening around the world, certainly in, in my lifetime, and obviously I, I don't want to say this is the worst. I mean, there's sort of other examples going on currently that are probably, you know, similar, but the idea of a full invasion and occupation of another country goes against so much of what we imagine to be at least, you know, capital L liberal norms and sort of the 20th and 21st century here, what's what's happening? Is something broken in Israeli society? Is this just sort of political Zionism run amok? Well, I mean, it's a challenging question because Israel does not have um, the absolute cleanest track record in maintaining such an international nor uh, stands of morality and norms about even very, very sensitive topics that are very important to Israel itself. For example, as we all know, one of the things that are most important in sort of Israeli politics and lore and things like that is memory of the Holocaust. And yet Israel has never recognized the Armenian genocide and does not recognize the Armenian genocide with the official reason being because of sensitivity of the relationships with Turkey. And this very often is thrown back in the Israeli policymakers face of saying, okay, so then if another country does not recognize the Holocaust, they can also say, well, we have political considerations. What do you want from us? Israel has maintained, yes, but we still don't recognize the Armenian genocide as a genocide. So yeah, I mean, this this was a big story about Hungary in terms of Israel's relationship with Orban a couple of years ago, because it was sort of a similar thing. I think a lot of liberal Jews in the West were saying, well, this is becoming increasingly alt-right and increasingly Holocaust revisionist. And on the other hand, Hungary was a, you know, and is an ally of Israel. So, you know, it was sort of a eerie alliance between Bibi and, and Orban that I think shocked a lot of younger, you know, liberal Jews that are in the West that maybe, again, there's, there, there are, there is two ways to view this. And so I do want to sort of hash these out and, and genuinely, you know, when a lot of things like this happen, I'll just be honest, I'm, I'm personally torn on how much of, of each path to go down. On the one hand, we can say, well, what do you want? You know, the entire point of Zionism to its to its success was basically to demystify the Jewish people, to turn them into a country like every other. You know, a country has a bureaucratic government. Okay, some some countries, you know, need to focus on their own self security more than others. Israel certainly could apply to be a part of that that role of countries because it has been attacked and challenged more than the average country. And so on the one hand, this is totally understandable. You know, why are we getting on Israel's case? Like, who are we, you know, sitting in nice Irvine to be talking about this? On the other hand, I mean, you know, to think of Zionism or Israel as sort of a exemplar of Judaism and Jewish values for the last 2000 years, it's like we, we kept alive this tradition of ethics and morals for 2000 years in diaspora, where we were basically getting like beat up from place to place only to then gain power, only to then basically turn a middle finger to it and say, oh, you know what, this whole thing about, you know, um, caring for the stranger because we were strangers in Egypt. Oh, that was only when we were the stranger. Now that <laughs> now that other people are the stranger, it's like, okay, whatever. And, and you do see sort of both of those different aspects, I think, coming to the forefront in Israeli society. Um, so I'm kind of curious to throw that out. Last question about um, Israel, Ukraine. I mean, I think it's your idea of Russia and Ukraine, right? Because in the world, it's sort of very obvious that you know Russia is you know Goliath and Ukraine is David, and here's the big bad coming and you know, everyone is on David's side. And Israel also always sees itself as David surrounded by Goliath and the Palestinians as David or all these other things and or other comparisons. And one of the things that's interesting just in terms of pointing to, you know, what's international norms and what side should you be in and not be on, a very interesting thing occurred after Israel started to more openly uh, advocate for the Ukrainian side and to vote against Russia, or at least to vote to oust Russia from the Council of Human Rights and things like that, that all of a sudden the Russian government started to say things that were very different than the way they would speak sort of neutrally about Israel in the past, like 
They suggested that Israel should stop criticizing Russia about any occupation it may have. Israel, which has the longest running occupation in history, should worry about its own problems. That is Russia trying to signal something. That's Russia signaling, you don't want to go down this dance with us because we can start playing the game, not just in terms of the military in Syria, in terms of lots of other diplomatic channels. Russia also for the first time in many, many years initiated a phone call with the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. Again, signaling to Israel, you don't necessarily want to dance with us here. So on the one hand, there is the push and pull within Israeli society of there's a moral side and you know we who see ourselves as David need to be on the side of David against the big bad. On the other hand, there is the sort of real politics side of Russia objectively being a very, very strong international force that is also diplomatically in the Security Council, allied with China, all these different things that are really pulling Israeli diplomacy to both ways, which is why you see the attempt to be sort of ambiguous and also then a lot of criticism, but then the prime minister himself trying to still say, but I'm still a mediator, so I need to take this sort of diplomatic channel. And that's really also sort of dictated Israel's policies. On the one hand, it's trying very much to send a lot of humanitarian aid, but it is desperately trying to avoid sending military aid or even defensive military aid just to not be seen as full out on one side versus the other. Yeah, the like three other things that I just wanted to throw out there and then, you know, I'm sure you'll have something to add, but then I would love to move on, even though we could talk about this all day. The first is, of course, that the, you know, former Soviet Union was probably the largest, you know, advocator of a lot of these anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist ideas throughout history, right? The famous or infamous Zionism is racism, you know, it was, of course, started by the USSR and things like that. So that's a really interesting also component here, as you're saying, Russia could take some of this and blackmail Israel, that wouldn't be shocking. The second, just in terms of Israel's neutrality, a lot of aid to Israel that has come from Western countries, you know, not just America, but also a lot of Western European countries in the last 70 years is directly to combat Russia. So it is strange that Israel all of a sudden now is thinking, oh, well, we don't want to sort of step on Russia's toes. I don't exactly know how Russia felt when you know, France and Britain and, and America <laughs> has and have and continues to basically, you know, stock Israel with with defense money and things like that. And so that's also, you know, and the last third thing, just in terms of this sort of intersection is Zelensky, the, the president or prime minister of Ukraine has sort of openly a lot of times compared Ukraine to Israel in terms of the, the threat. And so I, I don't exactly know what to make of that, but it, it does seem like in terms of this David Goliath analogy, at least Ukraine, or at least the leadership in Ukraine, is viewing Israel as another David and not a Goliath. Yes. I mean, Ukraine has a history, uh, specifically the Ukrainian president has a history of friendly relations with Israel. But also it's important to remember that Israel has historically always been seen as the ticket into the West. Any country that ever wanted to receive aid from the West, the easiest possible way, and we saw this with Egypt, we see, we're seeing this now again, resurgence with Turkey. We saw this with a lot of African countries. Every country that wants to look good for the West buddies up to Israel. That's the way to say we are friends with the West against all odds, against the fact that, you know, the Arab countries, so to speak, have oil or that Russia supports them. No, we're on Israel's side. And that is, I think, one of the things that also are pushing Zelensky to constantly say, you know, we and Israel are as one. You support Israel when it's attacked by big bad, because everyone knows that the others are the big bad. Well, here we are. Here we need defense capabilities too. You keep on saying Israel has a right to defend itself and you allocate them budgets and arms and things like that. Well, here we are. Don't we have the right to defend ourselves? So it's just one of these very simple and sort of historically entrenched ways of gaining support from the West. If you can be friends with Israel, that's an easy ticket uh, towards the West. I think that's actually one of the things that are like very much in Zelensky's mind, he's constantly trying to like show that we're on Israel's side. Interesting, because a lot of sort of run-of-the-mill, I think, pro-Israel people in America are sort of using that as the exact opposite in terms of, see, Israel is sort of the moral good on sort of this, the wider conflict side. Look, you know, Zelensky, who's, you know, also morally good is, is comparing. I, I want to move on because I know we can probably go back and forth on this all day. So, so in the past several weeks, we've obviously gone through sort of the civic high holidays 
of Israel with Yom HaShoah, Memorial Day, Independence Day. We've also um, had Nakba Day coming about a week and a half ago. And sort of right after, probably, I think it might have been the day before Nakba Day, Nakba Day is, is May 15th, we started getting reports that an Al Jazeera journalist had been shot in Jenin, a city in, in the West Bank. And immediately, and this was, you know, before anybody can possibly gather any objective facts, we started seeing two completely different narratives come out, right? We obviously, the, the official narrative of Israel that then subsequently became the official narrative of much of the quote unquote pro-Israel world is that we have no clue what happened. The IDF was responding to some terrorist activity in Janine, as it often does, and sort of journalists got caught in the crossfire. The official story of a lot of the wider media world, a lot of the other journalists that were on the ground, and obviously a lot of the sort of anti-Israel world was Israel assassinated this, this journalist. Um, since then, it doesn't seem like we've figured much else out. I mean, some, some other couple things have come out. The PA apparently refused to, you know, try to scope it out with Israel. So that was sort of a chuck mark on the uh, pro-Israel side. See, look, they won't even check this out on sort of the the Israel killed this journalist point of view, you know, some videos came out that made it seem like this actually wasn't in the middle of a firefight. So before we probe this deeper, just what are your sort of general thoughts on this sort of immediacy of two different narratives coming out before even talking about the event? It's a good question because Israel's response is fairly unique or it's a new way of response compared to in the past. In general, um, well, let me say this. There's a couple of things that make this case interesting. First of all, the journalist, um, Shirin Abuakla, is very famous. That's one of the things that are important. This wasn't just another journalist that happened to be caught in the crossfire. She's a very respected journalist. She's been in many conflict zones and has also somewhat of an aura of an honest journalist, right? as opposed to a lot of journalists often in conflict zones that are perceived from this side or that side. She has a very had a very respectable aura about her. So there's something very symbolic about the fact that she was killed in this crossfire. She's also very experienced, right? A lot of things about journalists. She didn't happen to wander into a crossfire, wasn't wearing the bulletproof vest that said press or things like that. She's a very experienced journalist. Immediately, as we know, in conflict zones and specifically surrounding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whenever anything happens, the sort of Palestinian social media is very, very, very quick to put out a narrative. It's very quick to openly go out and say, Israel did this, Israel did that. And the Israeli side, out of, I assume, this position of trying to be more respectful, authoritative, says, we'll do the investigation and then we'll put out narrative. And from a PR perspective, that's always been wrong. That's never worked. Right? We recall when Israel bombed out the uh, AP building in Gaza, even though Israel had what to say in, in its defense, the fact that that comes out a week or two later, the narrative is already entrenched. It is already within everyone's hearts and minds. And the fact that Israel then puts out a report that says, actually, we have a different version of what happened doesn't mean anything anymore. The fact that the military immediately put out a narrative that said, it does not look like our soldiers were in the present were present there, it does not look like something that happened from the Israeli side, but we'd like to have an investigation, did a lot sort of take the wind out of the sails of the Palestinian narrative. Hmm. So that's it's almost, I mean, just, so, sorry to cut you off. I'm just sort of openly reflecting here. Obviously your statement's descriptive, not normative, but what you're sort of describing is a situation in which by necessity now, whenever something happens, both, both sides in the media, um, the pro-Israel media, the anti-Israel media has to immediately publicize the conclusion that their side was, was in the moral right, because if they don't, the other side's gonna either lie or jump to conclusions that they have no way of knowing. And so we no longer have, I mean, what you are describing is not journalism. You're describing two different sides of propaganda that are, you know, it's like, I can already write the next news report the next time, let's say a Palestinian's killed in the West Bank. Oh, he was a terrorist. He had weapons. No, Israel just decided to shoot him for no reason because they like killing babies. Like, you know, I, I don't well, know. But, but that is what I was saying was not journalism. Right, what I was saying was specifically not how journalists report, but what each side to a conflict likes to put out. And that, unfortunately, is part of conflict today. You know, the war going on between Russia and Ukraine, where we started, is one of the most televised wars right, in history. I mean, he was televised. I'm sure he should use something different now with social media. 
but right, you can get reports on the ground every moment. And in terms of, for example, the amount of soldiers that were killed by from once in one side or another, reports range from 3,000 to 25,000. Now that should raise alarm bells. How is that possible? In a war where everyone's watching 24 seven, we can get reports on the ground all the time where every soldier has a smartphone and can be reporting, how is it possible that we don't know what's happening? And the reason is that today as part of warfare, as part of international conflict, you put out a narrative long before you have any facts. You need your narrative to be the one that's out there, to be the one that everyone is talking about and the other side is responding to. So unfortunately, I do think that is a part of current conflict. Does it corrupt journalism and make it a lot harder to know what actually happened? Yes. Hmm. I was saying that that is not journalism I was saying. That is just how, why, why and how each side immediately puts out a narrative long before they have any facts. So that, that in this case, again, I'm not su suggesting it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying this makes, th this makes it unique and why, as you said, before anyone knew what was happening, both sides already knew what was happening. Now, in terms of what actually happened on the ground, it does seem like we may actually not know because all the reports seem to indicate that there was a gunfire. Janine is a very, very densely populated area. Israel was engaged in a military incursion there. There was crossfire going from all sides. And I do agree with you, it is fairly damning that the Palestinian Authority has refused to submit the bullet that killed the reporter for an international investigation. It has refused to submit a lot of other evidence from the reporter's death to an international investigation. This is being used by Israel's side to say, okay, clearly the other side has something to hide in terms of its narrative. But again, the, all the debate ends up being about the narrative, right? Unfortunately, in terms of how the winds of time and history goes, what actually happened and happened ends up mattering a lot less to most people. That is just unfortunately a, a fact of time, right? If I take you back to a conversation that you and I had a while ago about the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? Everyone remembers that there was a suicide attack at the airport. But if you ask most people, how many people died? What was that? Influ how was it influential? What happened? Most people don't know, right? What you remember is that an event happened and that's it. So that's every side is rushing to try to cement. When you remember this, this is what you remember, regardless of what the truth was. This is what you remember from this event. So that's unfortunately what we're pretty much left with at this point. Yeah, one of my so so one of my majors in undergrad was cognitive science. So I took a lot of classes <laughs> and and stuff about memory and the malleability of memory. And just the more you learn about human perception and also memory, the more you become attuned to just the ways in which it's actually very easy to captivate, brainwash, propagandize, whatever word you wanna use, large chunks of people, even to the point, I remember one fascinating scientific experiment that let's say a topic that you are not, you know, super well read on. I, I know, you know, you personally must be well read on, on you know, almost Which every course, topic under the sun, but let's, you as know. all academics are. Okay, so you're, you're, you're Israeli, so let's say baseball, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so right, if, if I told you a random statistic about baseball, and then a couple of minutes later, I told you, but that statistic is not true. I just lied to you. I made it up. And then in two weeks, you were pulled about baseball. You're actually more likely after hearing what I just said to affirm the truth of my statement than if I just never mm -hmm. said anything at all. And so even if you present a fact for the sheer point of saying, but that's not true, that actually gives a little bit of legitimacy to that side in people's memory, because exactly what you just said, people aren't so good at the oh, I learned this fact, but actually it's not true. They just remember, oh yeah, this and this correlation, bing, you know, for some reason that's the way memory encodes things. And so it, it is really interesting. Sort of the first, the, the one thing I want to say just to sort of, I guess, reflect on this in my own life. The first time I really noticed this sort of like, there are two narratives and neither side seems particularly intent in figuring out exactly what happened. It's just, we have our two narratives in I think 2010 with the Gaza flotilla raid where you start having, you know, these reports where there was a flotilla full of activists and journalists that were, you know, around Gaza and Israel attacked it and ended up killing people. And sort of on one side, the narrative was they were sneaking in weapons. On the other side, the narrative was they were a bunch of activists, you know, were sort of, you know, crossing international waters just to make the activist -y point and Israel decided to, uh, and, and I just remember, like, I don't, I don't actually know what happened because just the way in my memory, it's just, we have two different narratives and it's sort of like Schrodinger's cat, like, Maybe maybe Israel was in the right, maybe they weren't, but it, it's almost like that doesn't matter anymore. And it, it seems like sadly, that's becoming more and more the reality with Israel, 
once people have sort of taken their sides and dug in. I think that that's true, not just about Israel. That is unfortunately one of the byproducts of populism and of sort of this depolarization that you're seeing across lots of different countries on virtually any topic. And the real reason behind, behind that is that when you have more and more polarization, then you're far more entrenched into your own beliefs, into your own side, and you're willing to overlook anything that you may disagree with on your side because the other side is just seen as such an enemy, such a villain, it's us against them. So as an example, right in the United States, if you might be more on the Democrat side or more on the Republican side. So very commonly, right, you, you are more willing to overlook sort of either bad statements or bad press or something from your side. Well, it's not a big deal, right? If I'm a, if I'm a Democrat, and there's someone in the Democratic Party says something I don't like, okay, that's not a big deal. I'll look the other way because it's some greater thing. Whereas if that same thing is done on the Republican side, that's a huge deal, right? That, that, that damns that entire party to me. And the more you have polarization, the more you're willing to overlook more and more from within your side because it doesn't matter. Your side has to be right. The other side is so far gone. It's such an enemy and this is what populism does. It makes the other side, the opposition, an enemy. And so you're willing to overlook all kinds of things that happen on your side. And you're seeing this very much in Israel or in debates about Israel more and more. That again, the pursuit of the truth doesn't matter because what matters is that your side is the side that you know is right. So if the truth comes out, but that doesn't affirm your side, you're not interested. It's not that you, you may not even think that it's, that it's lies, but that's not a big deal. Right, so it doesn't. So it didn't matter. Okay, so there was one incident that happened, but it doesn't matter because the my side is right anyway. So this is something that's happening across the world that I think very much goes with what you were saying about sort of like cognitive dissonance, or at least what you're willing to believe and how you're willing to believe it. Um, that I think is very pertinent also to what facts we're looking for, or if we're looking for facts and how. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think in terms of this sort of wider negative partisanship, we're seeing both in, in American politics between right and left, and also just in terms of how people talk about Israel. Needless to say, it's obviously terrible. So, you know, if you do have any good uh, good political science solutions there, you know, you can win a couple of different uh, Nobel Prizes. Um, just moving on, still talking about the, the journalist, um, but now moving to the funeral, because that was sort of the next major flashpoint of, you know, videos of the funeral that were coming out that just from a zero context perspective, which it was, you know, this is probably the most I've seen Israel demonized on social media since last May when, you know, during the Gaza war, it seemingly it was ubiquitous. This was the most I've seen Israel featured on sort of wider Twitter and Instagram and things like that was video of the funeral. And it seemed like you had some pallbearers holding the coffin and all of a sudden, you know, dozens of Israeli police raid and they're sort of beating people and the coffin ends up getting knocked down. Is, is there context there? I mean, sort of like, can, can you help unpack that? Unfortunately, there's very little positive to say if like looking at it um, in terms of what happened, if you want to try to look at it from, you know, let's look at it from Israel's perspective, there's still very little positive to say there. So the funeral took, pla took place in East Jerusalem. So a bit of context, because that's what makes this very complicated. East Jerusalem is the part of Jerusalem that was taken over by Israel in 1967 and immediately annexed. So different than the West Bank, East Jerusalem was officially annexed to Israel and is not under martial law. However, in all international negotiations and as far as the PLO and the Palestinian Authority is concerned, East Jerusalem is simply the same as the rest of the West Bank, just because Israel decided that no, East Jerusalem is different than let's say Janine or Ramallah, that doesn't mean that it's different. Why this is important is because from Israel's point of view, it says that East Jerusalem is under Israeli jurisdiction. And that means that what happens there has to follow Israeli laws. For example, you are not allowed to wave Palestinian or PLO flags. That is still considered an act of sedition. In turn, from the Palestinian side, this is simply part of the West Bank. East Jerusalem has come up again and again. For example, 
every time there have been elections in the Palestinian Authority, there's always a big question because Israel refuses to allow polling stations in East Jerusalem because as far as they're concerned, that is not part of the Palestinian Authority. And that was the pretense, by the way, for why the Palestinian Authority- be, I mean, again, again, there has to have been, or, or maybe not, and maybe you know, me and you just need to enter Israeli politics, but there had to have been some closed door conversation of high up Israeli officials in the police force saying, listen, the whole world just thinks we murdered a journalist. Whether or not that's true or not, put that aside. There's going to be this funeral that's going to be on every major news platform. They're probably going to be waving flags. Let's not attack them and beat them up. Like I, I would have to imagine that made it in some memo somewhere. So there is, you do have to take a couple of things into consideration. First of all, in and around the funeral, there were sporadic acts of violence. There was stone throwing, not from the funeral procession, but there were stone throwing. So it was a very highly contentious moment. Israel's police force was not the regular police. It was the Magav, the border police, which is more accustomed to handling violent Palestinian incidents. And even though part of the political establishment did say the funeral should be allowed to proceed uninterrupted no matter what, on the ground, the police officers were still ordered to uphold the Israeli law, which says this will not turn into a propaganda moment for showing East Jerusalem as part of the Palestinian Authority. To tell you, should it have been done or should it not have been done, or was this not an absolute PR disaster? And if Israel wants to maintain its position as you know David versus Goliath, that is what you should not do. <laughs> Go in and stop a funeral and beat up pallbearers. Absolutely. Like I'm not suggesting by any means that this was something thought out. This seems to have been an order from the ground, from officers on the ground saying, we're gonna uphold, we've been ordered to allow the funeral to continue. That means uphold law and order. Law and order means the funeral can continue, but there will be no Palestinian flags. There will be no chance for Palestine. There will be none of these things, which of course there were. What actually transpired in terms of the police going in with batons and beating people up all in an attempt to catch a flag and stun and pull down Palestinian flags, I would bring you back to what I said at the beginning. There's very little that can be said in terms in terms of you know intelligence and thought put in that can make Israel look okay with this to say, well, this was well thought out and this is this was their intent. No, it just wasn't thought out. It just was not actually thought how will this look and what is the benefit versus what are the costs. I will also add that you have to remember that there's a lot of coalition considerations. The coalition is trying to balance the left and the right. The prime minister is from the right, but is dealing with a lot of criticism from the right. And I don't know what exactly was said from this minister to that minister, but I can imagine that a lot of people are nervous to come out as too soft or too left or too right because they're being criticized from the other side. Um, but yes, there's very little positive to say about that. There was a narrative that that is still circulating that I don't know what to do with. So that's why we brought you on this podcast that says that actually the coffin was stolen by sort of terrorists and that even the family themselves asked the IDF or the Israeli police to get involved and get it back. And really what we saw, even though the optics of it look terrible, is this coffin being stolen by demonstrators and the family was actually in the background out of screen, basically asking the Israeli police to do what they did. Is there any, any legitimacy to that? Do you know where that idea might've come from? Unfortunately, I don't think there's any legitimacy to that. I say unfortunately not because it would make this look this way or that way. I just don't know where that came from. Um, what I do know is that the official police response to the event has been that there were stone throwings in and around and that the police were responding to insurrections in and around and that they were trying to uphold law and order, which means, again, possibly trying to take down the flags. The police have not put, up, put that out. And I suspect that if that was the case, the police would be very happy to put out an official statement saying, this is the call that, that came in, this is what we were doing, and this is how it was done. So I would put very little stock in that, not to mention the footage themselves does not show any attempt to restore the coffin to somewhere else to actually, the police were not going after the coffin itself. Some pallbearers 
did get themselves beaten and therefore the coffin almost fell, but the police were not trying to return the coffin to any other participant. So I don't put any stock in that narrative and I have not heard any official narrative of Israel saying that. Um, where it came from, I return you to what we were saying about each yeah. side just immediately trying to put out a narrative to say, this is what happened, this is why my side is actually the good one. No, definitely. I I, I saw that sort of other narrative coming out and, and tried to find some legitimacy. And it really does almost seem like it was invented out of thin air. I mean, maybe more information will come out after this podcast comes out. And and really, I, I actually genuinely do hope that's the case, because I still do believe that the majority of the time Israel uses its military or police, it is sort of in in search of good, even if every individual event, you can say, well, that might not be the best, you know, sort of it does combine to sort of this wider puzzle of you know, being on the good side of, of ethics. I think with, with this example, I mean, I also, you know, sort of my, my wider philosophy as, as a Zionist is that an important part of being a Zionist is also criticizing Israel, just like I think an important part of being a Jew is engaging with and criticizing Jewish tradition and Jewish ideas. If it's actually when you don't care about something that you just leave it alone and say, oh, screw it, you know, who cares what's going on? And so I think it's actually a more mature and, and also I think a more it highlights greater love for the country when you're actually willing to criticize it because if it's just sheer love and acceptance, you're not you're not loving something, you don't have a relationship with something, you're idolizing something. And Jewish tradition is very against the creation of idols, as you know, we know. Um and so this this was bad, meaning I, I think unequivocally, <laughs> no, because because again, like there is such an urge to put out, oh, listen, you know, go into like these Talmudic, you know, it was complicated and this happened and that. This is crazy. I mean, this is sort of like all of the worst parts of, you know, situation that's going on in, in the West Bank with Israeli military presence and sort of weird status of East Jerusalem with the people there not being citizens, but being under Israeli sovereign rule, but, you know, them not being citizens for the sake of law. And also this sort of weird rule with the flag that sort of is obviously a very not liberal type <laughs> view of which flags you're allowed to wave, even though obviously America has some of those laws, too mixed with sort of just pure police police brutality. And, and it's 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 hurtful because a major anti-Israel left-wing talking point of the last couple of years has been the connection between Israel and American police brutality. And I think a lot of that is sort of anti-Semitic, this idea that Israel trains American police officers to, to do all that. But this this was a clear case of police brutality. I mean, this this looked you know, very similar to cases of both American, but also even, you know, authoritarian countries when they just crack down on things that are happening and there's no conscious and no attention to how much harm they're causing. And they're just, you know, beating and basically they don't care about the ethics of it. And, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of shocked and, and don't really know what to do with this other than say, this is bad. Do people recognize, I mean, meaning is this it's something... Yeah, it's very tricky in the Israeli case, and this is something that is very hard for, again, anyone on any side to try to sort of analyze the fact that Israel officially has two to three different tiers of regime and two to three different policing bodies. And East Jerusalem, this is why I said we have to take note of the fact that East Jerusalem is exactly in the crossroads of all of these. So in Israel, the parts that Israel has officially annexed within the Green Line, et cetera, there's official Israeli law, there is the police, not the military, and the police as its role, right, is to, you know, protect and serve, serve and protect, depending on which country you put that first or that first, but whether there's brutality or not brutality, it's within the framework of civil rights and civil liberties, and there's fair criticism of that. Then in the West Bank, it is an area that is officially under martial law, which means the Israeli police has no presence there. The policing body is the military. It's the IDF, right? A military is not there to protect and serve. It's there to fight enemies. And there is no infrastructure of civil liberties but the and civil irony, rights. Just to, just to stop you there, the IDF, even in the name, is to actually defend. And then there's sort of this weird question of, is the IDF's role, perhaps from some conception, it's actually to defend 
the people living in East Jerusalem under a land that Israel annexed. Meaning, the, this is again why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is so is so. Well, no, but hang on. There's 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 something to distinguish again. What I was talking about now under martial law is not East Jerusalem. That is uh, the West about. Bank. The West Bank is a situation that is under martial law. The Israeli police has no presence there. And the only policing body is the military or specific military units like the border patrol, which also have policing authorities. This is where East Jerusalem becomes very problematic, right? It would not seem, even though this looked obviously horrendously bad and was horrendously bad, it would be less surprising to see something like that going on in Janine. If the military clashed with a funeral and then stones were possibly thrown and then things looked bad, that happens in the West Bank far more frequently because it is considered a conflict zone in which the military is involved. In East Jerusalem, where theoretically this is an area that's been annexed by Israel, so it's supposed to be governed by the police. However, the units that are there primarily are the border patrol that are engaged far more often in the territories against Palestinians, not as a policing that's there to solve crimes or protect you, but actually much more as an arm of the government engaged with fighting terrorism, that is exactly where this starts to get far more complicated. Because it is not just about you know, police brutality and what were they thinking, because those are the same units who might be sent in at any point in the West Bank as part of a raid, as part of something that is meant to hunt down you know, people who have carried out acts of terror. So it is obviously from the unit's point of view, if you're all of a sudden ordered, okay, you're now going in to stop the flags that are there. And the fact that it's East Jerusalem, but one hill over and it's the West Bank creates this very, very problematic thing that is difficult to compare to instances of police brutality in the United States. Because in the United States, right, you don't have the same sort of different tiered system. It's almost as if you would try to compare police brutality in the United States and possibly how the US military operated in violations of human rights in Iraq, right? The two are very hard to compare. One is engaged in an active war zone, the other is policing at home. Whereas in Israel, when the difference between the jurisdiction of an active war zone and the jurisdiction of police at home is occasionally, sometimes literally one hill over, it creates this very, very problematic instances of who has jurisdiction, what police units, who has rights, what rights do they have? And thus you end up with something like this, unfortunately. Yeah, well, this is almost, I mean, the, the wider difficulty and I think the complexity of the wider Israel-Palestinian conflict is Israel obviously took over three areas where Palestinians were formerly living. I mean, post-48, of course, right? There was Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, and Israel did three different things with those three different <laughs> lands, and none of them were successful, right? Israel pulled out of Gaza, that turned into a Hamas enclave, and the West Bank, Israel went from, you know, obviously the Oslo Accords and trying to set something up with the PLO and, you know, subsequently the PA, that obviously, you know, was frozen in the middle and doesn't work. And then with East Jerusalem, Israel annexed with attempt to offer citizenship. And that was, of course, turned down. And now there's all these disparities. So, you know, just there's definitely no no easy. I mean, if, if we were hoping to end this podcast on a, a positive note, that, that, <laughs> that definitely isn't it. Staying in East Jerusalem just for one second, because there's one more thing I want to pick your, your brain on. So in the next couple of of weeks, we're going to get, you know, a couple new opportunities, I guess, for uh, flare ups. There's obviously the infamous uh, flag march on Yom Yerushalayim, where people usually, you know, right wing activists, I, I will, I will admit, and maybe I'll do a public tshuva on this podcast. 10, 10 years ago, in my first year of yeshiva, I was I was there in the uh, Jerusalem march, you know, Ooh, the wrapped in flags banging on as many uh, shops as I can. And I, I, genuinely feel terrible about it every time I think about it and was like, what the hell was I thinking? Um, but, you know, you'll, we'll, we'll get people, you know, of course, marching through all of the Arab quarters of East Jerusalem, basically attempting to, I don't even know what, you know, assert dominance on Mr. al Chai, all, all the things, you know, there's also been recent talks and flare ups with the Temple Mount. What's your sort of prediction for going into the summer when things generally flare up anyway? Are we sort of in for a rocky summer? What's what's going to happen? Um, well, s since you look back and say, well, here's where I, where I may have gone wrong, I'm going to say that when I was a graduate student in 2014, and there was a spot of bother starting flare up in Gaza, I immediately 
calmed everyone down and said, no one's interested in this escalating, don't worry. So given what happened after that in 2014, I have since learned to not make- It's a great thing you didn't tell me that before I asked you to be on this podcast. Otherwise, I would have- <laughs> I, w- I waited for this end of the second time. Um, so I'm very hesitant to make predictions. Um, I will say that the extent to which things flare up in Israel, unfortunately, often tend to be linked to the political situation and the political stability, both of the Israeli government and of the different actors like within Hamas and within the Palestinian Authority with the PLO. Even what happened last year in May, which seemingly was around Ramadan and was around Jerusalem Day and was around all these things, what actually was happening is the Palestinian Authority had canceled the elections and Hamas threatened to flare up the area in response. In turn, Netanyahu had just surrendered the mandate to form a government over to Lapid. And even though the military came to Netanyahu after five days openly and said, we have completed what we set out to do in Gaza, we can stop now. Netanyahu said, no, we're continuing because it was politically convenient to make sure that the negotiations with you know, the United Arab West will not, will not sort of bear fruit. So unfortunately, whether things will escalate or not, um, or the extent of escalations for that way, tend to uh, be contingent on the political stability or instability. So all these things are potentials for escalation. Itamar Ben-Gvir has already said he's going to come to the flag march. There's recently been a court case that has suggested that Jews should be allowed to pray on Temple Mount and Hamas has threatened retaliation and all these things. However, the extent to which that actually occurs depends a lot on the sort of stability of the coalition. Right now, today, there are there is a very controversial vote going on in the Knesset um, over a law that's called Mimadim Limudim, from uniform to schooling. And that is a law that's supposed to give form, uh, veterans um, of combat units scholarships for school that the Likud has said they're going to vote against because they want to vote against the government. And then the government's not going to be able to pass that law. But as we know, in the last several months, the government lost its majority. It then almost lost one more member from Meretz, which would have been enough for the opposition to overthrow the Knesset. That person, Rinaw Zet, uh, Zet Zoabi, excuse me, um, has since returned to the coalition. But I would say that the possibility is there, but the extent to which these things spiral and spiral out of control depend on the it, internal cohesion of the different governing bodies, Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas. Um, and that is what's going to determine if we have a rough summer or not. Gotcha. Well, I have my tickets booked for Israel for uh, June 15th through 26th. So uh, I guess if, I'll, I'll let them know. <laughs> you'll, you'll let them know. It was, uh, you know, listen, it can't, can't be any different than uh, last summer. I was there for a couple, you know, <laughs> some, some time in May. And then I returned during the, you know, whole Sheikh Jarrah conflict. I was actually at Sheikh Jarrah talking to people on, on both sides a week after it happened as a part of a, a Hartman fellowship that I was doing. So, so yet again, you're the, the culprit is what I'm hearing. Exactly. About. Yes. The, uh, that's the, uh, you know, so, something else I learned in my uh, cognitive science major is that correlation does not equal causation. It's sort of, uh, um, <laughs> anyway, any, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. Anything else that you think people should be thinking about or knowing or talking about? Um, again, I think the biggest thing that I would say is, look to the cohesion of the coalitions because that's what ends up determining how much things escalate. Much like, for example, when the coalition lost its majority, when Edith Silman decided to leave the coalition, it was simply because the Minister of Health ordered hospitals to enforce a law that the Supreme Court had said has to be enforced. But all of a sudden, it, she decided, no, this is enough for me to break the coalition. And she was actually the chair of the coalition. This is enough for me to break it apart. Now, all kinds of deals that were done sort of behind the scenes seem to suggest there were a lot of other reasons, but it's these internal things within the coalition that end up making things a big deal. This would not have been a big deal. That was the law of Hametz over Passover. That would not have been a big deal. But all of a sudden, when this becomes something that brings apart the coalition, it's a big deal. And the same goes with all these other things. So look to there rather than just to the flare-ups of violence.
Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Alun Burstein. Always a pleasure getting your thoughts on all things Israel current events. Thanks, Ram.